Okay, so in this lesson, we'll install SQL and run it to connect to a database. I'm inside my text editor. I use Vim, but you can use any text editor you want. First and foremost, you need to make sure that you have Ruby installed. You can type in ruby-v and you can see the version for it. I'm using Ruby 2.0 and this is the minimum required version. If you don't have any Ruby version installed, then check the link in the show notes on how to install Ruby in your machine. Now that you have Ruby installed, you can create your own separate folder in your machine so that we can put all of our code inside. I'm inside the respective folder and I'm going to create a gem file. The gem file is always a good source to specify your dependencies. So I'll declare a source which is going to be HTTPS rubygems.org. This is standard procedure. Now let's indicate the dependencies that we need for our learning. Installing SQL is as simple as declaring the SQL gem in your gem file. You can always go ahead and type in gem install SQL in your command line and it will install it. However, it is always a good practice to have a gem file and that's why I'm doing this. After this, I'm going to have one extra gem that we'll use to print out information. So I'll declare the awesome underscore print gem. It's a funny looking name for a gem, but it actually works pretty well. I'm also going to include the pry gem so that we can use pry. Pry is an excellent alternative to IRB, the standard REPL for Ruby. Next, we're going to need to install a gem that contains the set of adapters and connectors to your database. I'm going to give you more than one choice. So if I want to, I can install SQLite 3 to connect to a SQLite database. Or if you want to, you can install the PG gem to connect to a Postgres database. If you want to, you can also install MySQL 2 to install the MySQL gem. This will allow you to connect to a MySQL database. To be very simple, I'm just going to use the SQLite 3 gem. I know for a fact that macOS 10 contains SQLite built in and most Linux distributions should have this as well. If you already have Postgres installed, then this should be a valid option to you and MySQL respectively. So now this is set up, I'm going to type in the bundle command. The bundle command will install all of the dependencies and only after that we'll be able to connect to a database. Okay, you can see that SQL is now installed. Its latest version at the time of the recording is 490. Okay, now that's set up, we can go ahead and run pry. I'm going to run pry because it allows us to have an interactive environment. Okay, now that we're at it, let's think of a way to connect to a SQL database. There are two ways we can connect to a database. We can use a string that represents a URI, or we can pass in a hash of options. Let's try the first one. I'm going to type in sql.connect and I'll pass in a string. The string will be something like SQLite colon and then double slash. I'm going to pass in, for example, db.sqlite3. The file doesn't exist, but once SQL connects to a SQLite database, if it doesn't exist, it will create it. So let's press enter and you can see that SQL is not actually required. So let's do that. Let's require bundler first and then calling in bundler.require. You can see all of the dependencies being loaded. We get SQL, awesome print, pry, and SQLite 3. So there you go. Let's try the command once again. Let's type in sql.connect and that respective URI. Remember that if you want to use Postgres, you need to type in Postgres SQL, or if connecting to a MySQL database, just type in MySQL. For now, let's stick with SQLite. I'll press enter now and you can see that we get a new instance of an object. It's called SQL SQLite database. This database class inherits from the standard SQL database. There's no SQLite in the middle of the class hierarchy. SQLite double colon database contains all of the code necessary to actually connect to a SQLite database. 
If we do get an object being returned by that command, we can instantiate it into a variable. So let's do that. db equals sql.connect with that string. Now we can access the db object. This is the object that we'll be using throughout the entire course to access our database. It is its representation. So if we want to, we could access an entire table, for example, posts. This will more than obviously raise an error because we haven't created any table yet. And we won't do anything in that matter, at least for a couple of lessons. I'll provide a skeleton first, but you won't be able to see it. So if we press enter here, all you get is a data set. You get a SQL query that represents that data set. So even though you can do that, it won't actually create anything. Because if we try to access the first record, you will see that there's no such table. The database exists though, but the table does not. Okay, now that we can connect to a database, I'm going to leave the prize session and I'm going to create a new file. Actually, two files. The first one is going to be called connectwithyaml.rb and the other one will actually be a database.yaml file, just like Ruby on Rails. We can use the same strategy. Still, you can store this database configuration in any way you need, as long as you respect the hash of options that we'll use to connect to the database. We'll create the same database here, which is going to be the result of typing in sql.connect. But then we're going to pass in a hash of options. This hash can contain many different options. So let's go to each one of them step by step. This time I'm going to use PostgreSQL to connect because it requires user and password information, the database to be specified, and the host. This is a more complete example that I'm sure that you'll use throughout your entire experience on using SQL. So we need to pass in an adapter first, and the adapter will be PostgreSQL. Next, we need to specify some other information, such as the host. The host more likely will be localhost. We need to pass in a port, which more than likely will be 5432. It's just a standard port for PostgreSQL. Then we'll need to pass in a user. I'm just going to pass in my name and just double check that in just a second. And the password. Let me just pass in a random password like this. I'm going to configure a specific database for this example. Next, the very latest option is going to be the database. For every database system, you get more than one database repository. So the database, I can call it TOTS+. Plus. Okay, so I've checked my database and it seems I have to pass in the Envato user and the Envato database. The password is not necessary for me at the moment, so I'll just comment it out so that you can know you can type a password option in case you need to. Now let's go ahead and go to DB and perform a simple query to the posts table. Remember, this will only retrieve a data set. So I'll just print out a put statement to retrieve the contents of DB posts, just like we did when using pry. So with that being said, let me go ahead and clear the screen and type in Ruby connect with YAML file. If I type the enter key now, it will throw an error because SQL is not defined. Let's go ahead and require bundler and then call in the bundler.require method. This will require all of our gems. Now let me just replace puts with AP. AP is the method provided by the awesome print gem that allows us to have pretty output. Let's do the same thing again. Let's clear the screen and call this Ruby file. You can see the message being printed out here. It is an error that specifies that the PostgreSQL adapter is not found. And that was my mistake because it's not actually PostgreSQL, but just Postgres. Let's do it again. Let's clear the screen and do it all over. You can see that the PG gem is not being correctly loaded. Let's go to the gem file and uncomment this Postgres gem. Let's type in the bundle command to install it. You should have everything you need to interact with Postgres. Now that Postgres is installed, we can go ahead and run the same command. 
you can now see that we have a new data set object being printed out. Select asterisk from posts. Again, if we go ahead and print out the contents of all posts or just the first one, it will throw an error. There you go. You can see that the posts table doesn't exist. This message is slightly different than the one in SQLite, but that just relates to each different adapter. Now, what about porting this into our YAML file? After all, we're passing a direct hash, but we can do this differently in the way we can store our configuration on an external file and isolate that data. This is good for source control purposes, as well as to guarantee that personal sensitive data doesn't get passed if you don't wish to. Code stays away from data. So let's take this taken care of. Let me delete that code and paste it into our database YAML file. Now that's pasted in, I'm just going to format this properly in order to respect the YAML syntax. Okay, this seems about right. Let's save this file and go ahead to the Ruby file and handle this YAML file. And for that purpose, I'll require YAML. And then I'm going to provide a new file variable, which is going to be the result of yaml.load file. This method takes a file path. So I'll create that variable and instantiate it on top. File path is going to be file.expand path so that we can get an absolute location of our file. It is going to be related to this very file and will refer to the database YAML file like this. Reach out to the parent folder and go ahead deep down to the respective file. Now, all we need to do here is pass in that file. Let's do the same thing all over again. Now that we've done this, let's clear the screen and try and connect to the database. But before we do that, I'm just going to remove this instruction so we don't get any errors. So let's press enter. And you can see that YAML is not defined. My bad, this is going to be everything uppercase. So let's do that once again, run the file. And there you go. You can connect to the database and retrieve a data set based on what we wanted select the entire list of posts. Okay, so now you know how to connect to your database with two different ways, either by passing a standard URI string, or you just pass in a plain string of data that's actually a lot more flexible if you want to have multiple environments, like Rails does. You can have a development database, or you can have a test database to run your tests, and finally, a production environment. So that's it for this lesson. Let's move on to the next one where we'll actually start dealing with data. We'll start by actually reading some data. See you soon.